is now one o'clock um, and I am going to turn it over to Amber Chamberlain, who is with National Capital Treatment and Recovery, who's going to introduce our session and speakers. Yes, thank you, um, Julie. Uh, really, I have the pleasure of introducing our next and final presentation for today. Uh, this session will discuss the integration of peer support works to enhance how we provide SUG services. Uh, presenters for this session include Shay Davis from DC Health, Raphael Richardson from DBH, and two of our peer coaches uh, from Howard University and George Washington University Hospital, uh, William Ellis and Corrine Simons, respectively. So starting with Shay Davis, Shay is the Special Populations Coordinator at the District of Columbia's Department of Health. In her role, she oversees the Rapid Peer Responder Program, a peer program focused on linking individuals with an opioid use disorder to MAT and other special support services and oversees naloxone training and distribution for DC Health. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Biola University and a Master of Education in Community Development and Action from Vanderbilt University. Welcome, Shay. Uh, next, we have Raphael Richardson. Raphael is the Director of Consumer and Family Affairs Administration for the District of Columbia. She has 14 years of professional experience leading teams from project conception to completion, assessment and allocation of resources, resources and identification of strategic partnerships. Ms. Richardson obtained her BA in Psychology at Xavier University of Louisiana and <clears throat> currently works toward obtaining her Master's in Public Administration. Welcome, Raphael. And we also have uh, William Ellis with us. William is a DC native who works as an overdose survivor outreach program coach at Howard University Hospital. William holds a certification in substance abuse counseling and is very passionate about what really matters, his recovery and his family. Working as an OSOP coach helps William keep his recovery centered uh, while allowing him to give back to the community. Welcome, William. And finally, we have Corrine Simons with us. She has over 25 years of experience in management and direct services in the human services field. She is an overdose survivors outreach OSOP coach at the George Washington University Hospital. Corrine has been working at GWUH since November of 2019. She holds a master's degree in human services from Lincoln University. Thank you, thanks to all of you. And we will begin with Ms. Shay Davis and Raphael Richardson, thank you. I'm sharing the presentation now. You all should be able to see something, hopefully. Um, are we good to go? Thank you. Great. So hello everyone, my name is Shay Davis. Thank you for that, um, and that or I guess, introducing me. I really appreciate that. So um, Raphael, and are gonna, Raphael, Raphael and I are going to speak about integrating peer support workers um, into really the, to enhance substance use disorder services, basically. Um, and so, you know, the purpose is just to provide an overview of the role of a peer support worker. And we're really glad that we have some peers who are in this, you know, little session as well. Um, because we really don't want to talk about peers without having them as part of it. So we're really appreciative of that. And then um, we're going to talk about, you know, how they're already integrated into the continuum of, continuum of care in D.C. Um, and then, you know, just some re resources we can provide you if you're interested in integrating or you have integrated peers but would like some support. Um, so, you know, that's kind of hitting what the outcomes are. Um, so one question, I, I, or Raphael, you might want to ask this, but um, let's just start off with the first question. Um, do you, do anybody, does anyone actually currently employ peer workers right now? Um, or would you like to employ peer workers? If so, go ahead and put it in the chat. We're interested in, in knowing who's, who's with us right now, who has peer workers. Um, I guess it's not the chat, it would be the Q&A. Um, or they can also raise their hand. Oh yeah, raise your hand. I was like, what options do we have here? <laughs> so yeah, 
raise your hand if you currently employ peer workers. That would be helpful to know. Let's see if we have any. We have four. Four, four. hands raised. Okay, so can you people, you wonderful people who just rose your hand, can you put your hand down? And then I would like to ask who would like to employ peer workers? Who would like to start integrating peer workers into the work? Who sees that as something that could be valuable, could be helpful? Um, I'm interested in knowing that. Okay, so we have 51 people and we have one person who thinks that it could, maybe two, excellent, awesome. Awesome. So we're, we're getting some interest here. That's great. Um, yes, great. Cool. And then let's do one more question. For those, I guess there was only two of you, but for anyone else, maybe as well, um, if you're interested or maybe you're not interested, but do you feel that your organization has a strong understanding of the role of the peer, even those of you who have employed peers? Do you feel that your organization knows what a peer is supposed to do, knows what the role is? Um, yeah, and go ahead and raise your hand if you feel like, yeah, I, I think so. I think they, I think we would know what their, their role is. So it looks like we have one, maybe two. Great. So we have three, three. It should, I, I'd actually, if we could ask the reverse, um, since, since we've got we've got 50 yeah that's a good way to do it <laughs> the 50 attendees how by, by a show of hands how many um needs a better understanding of the role of peers um yeah. in your organization so perhaps yeah. you have peers but maybe you could benefit from a better understanding yeah let's see who who could benefit Right. I, I would imagine that it's the, a great deal of folks that have joined us here today, uh, interested in peer support, interested in what it looks like across the system. So thank you guys for, for participating um, in our little engagement, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so we'll go on, on to the, the next slide. Um, so one of the things as Shane and I were putting this presentation together, uh, we recognize that peers are working across the continuum of substance use services in the district, right? And so in order to really have a conversation about, well, what is the role of, our, of peer support? And when we say peers, we'll talk about a little bit later, we're talking about individuals with lived experience. When we say that, it's helpful to understand what that looks like. And so what we have here is the SUD service continuum in, in the district. So we have starting from an individual and their family, right? We know that they are the, uh, the nuclear. It all starts with an individual and their family, right? I know at Department of Behavioral Health, it's also at, at DC Health, we believe in person-centered care, right? And so we go from there to harm reduction, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And that's, you know, our different uh, prevention centers that we have that are uh, participating in programs of, of what we at DBH call Live Long DC. It's our, um, it's our um, initiative to reduce the misuse in opioid overdoses. Uh, we talk, you know, when we further go further on the continuum, we also have treatment, right? That's the medication assisted treatment facilities. Um, that's uh, the crisis stabilization. Uh, if we go a little bit further along that continuum, we have recovery. Uh, which we, uh, you know, everything from recovery housing to supportive employment, that's really helping individuals to get back on their feet. Um, and then we have the entire system, right? What does that look like? What are the different access points for individuals to receive, you know, to, to, to receive services, whether that's um, how do we utilize data, right? And a lot of times our peer specialists are, or, or recovery coaches are, collecting very, very important data that then feeds the entire ecosystem. So again, you know, we've got from the harm reduction, which is meeting individuals where they are and focusing on reducing the harm of drugs and or uh, mental illness. We've got treatment and that is literally addressing uh, those, those, um, those concerns with, the, with uh, substance use. And then we've got recovery, which is the process of change through an individual's life and improving their health and wellness and 
uh, in a manner that's self-directed and really striving, an individual striving to reach their full potential. Yeah. Next. Next slide. Beautiful. So, you know, this is a big part of it. What What is a peer? Um, and, you know, I think a lot of us know what a peer is, some of us don't, but peer support workers are people who have been there, right? They have been successful and, and we're talking about a substance use, we're talking about someone who's a, who has lived experience with substance use, right? A substance use disorder, for example. Um, there are peers in all other areas, but we're focusing on substance use right now. So um, they've been there, they've experienced similar situations, they have a shared understanding, you know, they're there to support the person, to provide them with respect and dignity, mutual empowerment, um, and peer support workers also, you know, for one, they can help people become engaged in the system, and then they can help someone stay engaged in that system. So, you know, and we have a little continuum here. We're really into the continuum right now. So, you know, peer support workers can jump into any part of this continuum, help people engage in, in these areas, and then stay engaged, um, and then move along the continuum as well. So we really, we really value the work of, of peer support workers. And you know, this is from SAMHSA. Peer support workers, there's, there is a lot of literature out there that supports peer support workers. These are some um, areas that, you know, SAMHSA has identified through a large lit search um, of ways that peer support workers have been effective. Um, and, you know, so increased self-esteem and confidence, increased sense of control and ability to make changes in, the li in their lives, um, increased sense that the treatment is responsive and inclusive of their needs, um, increase social support and social functioning. There's, there's a lot here. And, you know, in my own experience, when I, you know, I hire peers very often, and I always ask them, did you experience peer support? And this is in their interview. Did you experience peer support when you were in treatment or when you were trying to get into treatment or when you were in whatever part of your own recovery? And they will, you know, I'll get mixed answers, but you know, I've heard people say yes, and it was a game changer for me, right? It it made a huge difference because, for example, I had one person who told me I was at X treatment center, I wasn't connecting with a lot of the providers. But then when this Piero came along and said, Hey, those feelings of anxiety, those feelings of withdrawal, those feelings of e ETC, I've been there. I've done that, I've been there, I totally understand what you're saying. And that, that connection really made a difference for this person to the point where now he wants to make that difference for someone else. So, you know, these are things that I see regularly and hear all the time from peers who have had positive experiences with other peers. Um, yeah. Wonderful. So, so we've talked about, you know, we've talked a little bit about the system. We've talked about who, how we define peer. And so the function of a peer, and I'll just read here on the screen, uh, by sharing lived experience and practical guidance, peer workers help to develop their own goals, create strategies for self-empowerment, and take concrete steps toward building, fulfilling, and self-determined lives for themselves. Um, and so we break this down into four. Uh, when you look at SAMHSA, they actually have about six or seven categories. Um, today we'll share with you four of the larger categories that really uh, and we'll provide some examples for you. Um, so the four categories that you see here, peer mentoring and coaching, resource connecting and education, building community and facilitating and leading recovery groups. And so as we talk about defining a little bit, when we look at peer mentoring and coaching, this is really referring to one-to-one -to -one relationships in which peer leaders uh, with more recovery experience than the person that they're trying to encourage. Right? So they've got more experience, more lived experience, maybe they're clean a little bit longer or they've moved out of, um, you know, they've moved out of, you know, when we look at harm reduction and kind of moved out of the, what, what we would call the chaos, right, and moved into um, a safer position, right, just someone who they can help to navigate along and to motivate and support others that are also on that journey. Uh, Shay just mentioned an example. Uh, the second one, resource connecting and education, that's when our peers are really providing a connection to professional and non-professional services and resources in the community 
um, they're able to help that individual that they're supporting to meet his or her individual needs. Um, and sometimes that looks like um, reducing the barriers to get to treatment, right? So maybe that looks like identifying some transportation or some childcare uh, options, right? So that they can make it to treatment. Sometimes that looks like um, making sure that, um, you know, they're connected and they, you know, I keep going back, my mind keeps going back to transportation because that's yeah. such a, such a, a barrier right now in this virtual environment, we do something called virtual peer support, right? And I can tell you, we have another peer recovery conference that's happening right now at this very hour. Much of our time, although we, it's been amazing, some of that time is supporting other peers and accessing the technology, right? And so the resources to then, so in education, right, in terms of supporting individuals, I mean, this telehealth and, you know, that has been, I got to tell you, it has been one of the things I am hearing over and over um, throughout this time period where we're working from home. Uh, the second, the third rather, is building community. And this is so incredibly important. Um, and this is when peers are uh, participating in activities and building a network of friends, of new friends, old, old friends that are now in, in recovery or wherever they are, right, working this journey together. Because we know that it's not just a, a destination, it's a journey. Right, and so it's building that social network so that they are supported as they go forward. Um, it's really the, the sense of acceptance and of belonging to a group. And then finally here, we've got facilitation and leading of recovery groups, which we see happening in, in, in several provider agencies, right? In fact, as, you know, as I look at these four examples, it happens across that continuum, that SUD continuum care that I mentioned a bit earlier. And this is really structured support groups and structured educational activities. Uh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So here we'll dive a little bit into the difference between uh, the, the role of the peer support and the role of clinicians. And so I'm going to just pause here and encourage everyone to ask questions. If you've got questions, uh, use the question and answer feature. Um, so that, that we can answer, even if we need to pause a little bit, answer questions along the way, it's really important to, I know for Shay and I and everyone on the call to make sure that you get what you came for, right? If there's a particular question that you've got, we want to make sure to incorporate that in the presentation. We want to make sure that it's incorporated into the information that we're providing. So when we look at here, I'm not sure how, how many individuals have seen this, but this is actually the continuum of helping relationships. And we use this quite a bit in, um, in peer support. And so you'll see it's going from one directional and structured, very goal directed on one side, all the way the other side to reciprocal in nature and it's unstructured. And so I'm gonna start on the reciprocal nature um, and unstructured side when we look at friendship. Uh, when we look at peer support, you know, peer support is not a new concept. Right? It's not a new concept. We support each other through life. We walk through life together. However, what is different is that as we go through this life and this journey and we overlay uh, either mental health or substance use issues or disorders on top of it, uh, it serves a specific purpose, right? And so it's one thing, it's very different peer support as a, as a friend and then peer support as an individual paid and this is the profession that you've chosen, right? And so as we move a little bit further along the continuum, that's when you start seeing peers that are doing this professionally, right? Maybe they are volunteering at a particular organization. For example, we have uh, peer centers, peer operated centers that are operate as drop-in centers and they've got plenty of volunteers. It's all consumer run programming and they are facilitating groups. I just mentioned some of the function. They're facilitating different groups. They're connecting individuals to resources. Um, as you move further along, then they become, it becomes paid mentorship, paid facilitation. And so you'll see that happening quite a bit. You'll see that happening quite a bit at provider agencies, right, where they're offering peer support services. It's not quite treatment. Right, and I use that kind of in air quotes because if you were to ask a peer, this peer support is just as much a part of treatment 
as any other modality. Um, and so, you know, as we look at the, the peer support, that this, this definitely looks like the wrap groups that are offered at some of our uh, core service agencies. Um, some of the peers on the call today can talk about well, what that looks like specifically in the hospital as you're talking with folks and connecting individuals to resources. Um, this also looks like um, individuals in, in this particular area, peers are self-disclosing right, by profession, right, so they, sometimes I get asked, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference here with peer support and clinicians or, or, or psychotherapists, is, is, as you see on here, um, the difference is that lived experience is the leading foot, right, it's the leading part of the conversation, and I would never go as far as to box our peers in, because some of our peers are clinicians, right, our director of, of, of DBH wholeheartedly believes that peers should be at every level of leadership. Whether you decide to be a friend, whether you decide to work professionally and lead with your lived experience foot uh, and lead with that, that, that perspective, or you decide to run an agency or become a therapist, right? Um, so that, that's the, the primary difference. Um, I will say the, uh, one of the advantages uh, that I've seen over the years with individuals serving in that peer role is they are very, very close to the grassroots level. Uh, when I go out and do listening sessions, you know, unfortunately, sometimes they say my provider hasn't, my, I, don't, I don't know who my caseworker is, right? Because we know that turnover is, a, is, is an issue, right? It, it is an issue, it has been an issue, but I will say, uh, I will never forget being at one of our uh, drop-in centers and hearing a consumer say to me, I can't find my new provider, but I connected with Ms. So-and-so who's helping me navigate the system, right? So peers really are that, um, the liaison, the tr treatment liaison, the one that's helping to, um, to translate what's happening, the one that they, they are not the ones that uh, encourage someone to take medication or force some, a, a particular modality onto an individual. They're there as sounding board and it's life on life, right? In this kind of professional setting. And so um, we can go to the, um, to the next slide and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, within the, the issue, within the uh, substance use continuum, uh, when we overlay the function and purpose of a peer, what that looks like in the different um, SOAR initiatives. And so yeah. share what you offer. Yeah, some so, so, you know, th this should look a little familiar. We're looking at, you know, um, these are the different sort of functions that we're going to talk about. We just talked about peer mentoring and coaching, resource connecting education. There's going to be a few on the next slide. Um, and, and then we're kind of categorizing, all right, so under resource connecting and education, let's look at how peers are doing that in the different, um, in the different parts, either prevention, harm reduction, treatment, or recovery, right, in the different parts of the continuum. So I'm going to give an example for the one that I can speak to the easiest, which is the program that I oversee, harm reduction, and, and they're in harm reduction. They are the rumpy responders. They work directly with overdose survivors. Um, they provide resources and education all the time. They provide resources and education specifically about um, harm reduction, and, and really what that looks like is a person, for example, a person is using this much per day. Maybe they want to make a small change. So really harm reduction is just looking for small positive behavioral changes um, that people are willing to make, um, you know, to reduce the harm that drugs have on their body or et cetera. So for example, one of our rapid peer responders, you know, one of the things that we do within this harm reduction world is that we have reduced the requirements for what we hire or who we hire when we hire people. So we're not looking for a college degree or anything like that. Um, we're not looking for two years sobriety. One of our wonderful peers um, is actually uh, recently, or maybe within the last year or so, has started Suboxone. She's in a treatment uh, clinic and she's doing you know, great work. And she's able to speak directly to people in the community about what Suboxone is, where, or what medication assisted treatment is, that her experience of it. She can talk about which clinic she goes to, her experience with that place, the groups that she's in, um, what treatment is like. Um, so, so having that personal lived experience allows people in the community to trust her. And it's a big game changer. Um, and, and so 
Um, and she's able to provide actual education about it because one, we provide her with education. We provide her with lots of training. You know, if you're gonna have a peer program, you need to provide training. And then she, she has her own lived experience. So those two things go very well together. Um, so yeah, that's one example. And then uh, Rafael's gonna give another example. Yeah, another example would be, I mentioned a little bit earlier with our, our drop-in centers, right? They're really a space, and I can tell you, you know, um, at the height of um, the pandemic or the public health emergency, as soon as we, you know, we, we moved into this virtual space, our peer centers were out on the streets making sure folks were, had whatever virtual devices they needed. I have one center, there's five peer operating centers that are funded through Family Behavioral Health at this moment, making sure that, the, you know, one is focused on young adults, making sure that the young people had equipment, right, that the program participants, um, you know, I, I could think of another one that specifically made sure, you know, we had an individual that, you know, family member, you know, scared to leave the house. Right, and so how do you complete treatment? How do you go get your medication? How do you continue your treatment and you're scared to leave the house because of what you see on the news or what have you? And so that drop-in center has been instrumental in connecting and reconnecting folks back to their core service agencies during this time where it's, it's very confusing, right? It's a time where um, it's almost the, the paradigm shift, right? As I call it, where folks are used to going out to treatment and our now treatment is coming to them via telephone devices, via laptops, um, even even to the extent where you can't necessarily. Some of uh, many of our you know GBH has not reduced services. We have maintained the you know services, uh, behavioral health services throughout the entire pandemic. It looked like you know in the waiting room, not everyone in the waiting room only go at your assigned hour, your assigned time, um, and so you know the. You know, again, peers really operating as these liaisons and these partners with core service agencies and hospitals or, you know, whomever along that SUV continuum to make sure that people receive the services that are needed. Yeah. And our, our peers are, are, you know, they will certainly talk about what that looks like at the, uh, at the hospitals in just a few minutes. I'm so excited for, yeah. for everyone to hear, uh, hear from them as well. And so when we talk about resources for supporting peer teams, there's a couple of things. And so we'll go to the next slide. Uh, one of the things as Director of Consumer and Family Affairs that I really have seen is a need for organizations to be um, further supported in their efforts, right? I would say, I would, uh, you know, my last four plus years, I would say I've not met one provider who did it um, know the intrinsic value of individuals with lived experience. I've not met one who didn't know that. They all know that. But putting that into practice is a whole entirely different ballgame, right? Yeah. And so one of the resources that I use and I share with folks is uh, one of my colleagues out in New York, uh, for what the, the Consumer Family Affairs there in New York State, they've developed a toolkit. Uh, there are several toolkits, but I like this one because it's very simple to read. It's got an assessment that you can complete. It's got de uh, definitions and it has suggested next steps. And even in that assessment, it has, you know, I, I want to say nine different categories ranging from uh, cultural competency. Are you culturally competent? That, that shows up quite a bit uh, as I'm working and talking with peers and providers, providing a service that looks and feels in a way that's appropriate for that person's particular culture. Um, another area is person-centered care. Um, another area is supervision, right? How do we make sure that supervisors understand the dynamics and what that looks like to actually support the peer worker? I mean, Shay can tell you. Yeah, uh, I was just about to say. Go jump right in. I was just about to say, you know, you know, when I came into supporting peers, I didn't know that was going to be my role. And that happens a lot where people get hired to supervise yes. peer and they don't know that that's what they were going to end up doing. And they're a little bit like, whoa, okay, this is a little bit different than my past experience. And, you know, I've received trainings from Raphael and her, her group. And, um, you know, 
even just things on what kind of questions I should be asking in supervision. Things that you, you know, you don't think of naturally. And we don't, we don't have a, like a caring system normally with our supervisor, by, but supervisors. It's a little bit different, but you know, I, I've been provided with, these are questions I should be asking in my interviews. These are questions I should be asking in my supervision. These are things I should be looking out for, you know, and, and it's made a big difference in my experience as well. I would wholeheartedly agree. I, you know, I have a, a team of about a total, maybe about 12 to 15 peers. And it certainly, um, it certainly is something to be considered, right? What does supervision look like? How often? Yes. Uh, I will tell you that it is a very, very delicate balance between understanding where that individual is in their recovery process and managing the workload so that the initiatives and the work can move forward without it being overwhelming. I, I, I you know, was having a conversation actually with one of the uh, CEOs of uh, one of our provider agencies, and it is just uh, amazing to both of us that, um, you know, it's easy to understand self-care now that we're all working in this virtual environment. It's a little bit easier to understand, right? Because now case managers are saying, hey, I need a break from this Zoom thing. I'm, I'm yeah. Zoomed out. You know, uh, um, you know, I'm hearing C, you know, CSWs and, 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 and clinicians and, and, and the like say, okay, I'm really struggling, right? I've never seen this, which is wonderful. I've never seen this many wellness options, right? I think that's wonderful. And then I say, well, what do you think peers have been going through? Yeah. This entire time, right? So, you know, I would hope, you know, it's unfortunate that we have the pandemic, but I would hope that one of the lessons learned is to almost to kind of um, understand that the, the same type of support that we're now seeking as we're all zoomed out and we're trying to figure out how to engage and how to balance that work life, um, the work life flow, that peers need that same consideration um, on, on an everyday level, right? So I know when I'm talking with my folks, a very real question is how are you doing? Do you need, do you need space, right? Do you need time to go regroup so that we can have the conversation and we can get the work done? Because I'm all about moving the work forward, but we can't move the work forward without, you know, making sure that our peers are living their best self, right? So that may look like, okay, well, we need to, <laughs> we need to pause this conversation and figure out, okay, is, you know, do you need to talk with somebody about this? Is this, you know, one of the things I experienced quite a bit is having the conversation of whether is this, a trigger is thing triggering you or is something like something else happening right so that to, to parse through the experience so that we can name it and address it um and so i think that's it, i didn't mean to go on that tangent but I, yeah. I so let's, and let's kind of because we want to get to the peers we have about two more minutes so let's just briefly go over this and then pass it on to it. our wonderful peers um yeah so do you want to just speak briefly? There are some training resources in DC. There's plenty of them and training needs to occur for both supervisors and the peer support workers. So go ahead, Rafael. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, the Department of Behavioral Health, we have the, um, what's called the Certified Peer Specialist Training. We've also offer the peer supervision, supervisor training. And one of the things that will be happening for next fiscal year, uh, thanks to the Live Long DC initiative and the state opioid response grant, I, I, I like to call 2.0, it's our second uh, iteration of funding, is the peer university, right? Where we are able to support both on the provider side and the peer side, uh, pull all those trainings together so that they are all coordinated and offered in one particular place. And so as we move forward, you'll be hearing so much more information about that because we are uninterested in offering trainings that won't help you address the opioid epidemic. Where it's, it's not helpful, right? And so as we put this information together, put the full university, because why? Because peers deserve the best of the best to make sure that they are understanding what the, what the, what the given trends are, so that they're understanding and educating themselves and getting the certificates and what have you. Um, so you'll be hearing more information about that. Um, and that's both geared towards um, peers and providers. Yeah, and if you are interested in having peers, this is huge because basically you have a, 
beginning of a training plan. So what an amazing opportunity that you that you have. I mean, I had to develop a training plan myself and that is a game changer. So thank you everyone. We wanna pass it over. If there are questions, feel free to let us know, but looks like there are no questions yet, so. Thanks so much, Shane Raphael. Um, we are gonna pass it over to William Ellis, who is the OSOP coach at Howard University Hospital. He's gonna speak now. I think you just need to unmute yourself, William. There we go. Um, I don't think we can hear you, William. You might need a minute. Um, Kareen, did you want to speak? And we'll give William a minute to get his audio on. You're also on mute, Kareen. Okay. I Can you hear me? We can. Okay, great. I can't see me, though, but oh, you look I, great. I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Corrine Simons. I am a certified peer support specialist um, through the Department of Behavioral Health. Thank y'all, <laughs> Raphael. <laughs> um, I'm currently in the role of an OSOP coach at George Washington University Hospital. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the sponsors of the Opioid um, Response Symposium, in particular, Julie Gonzalez and um, Eden um, at DCHA for the opportunity to share uh, my experience and my take um, on integrating um, the services of peer support workers to enhance um, SUD services. So bottom line, um, as peer support specialist or OSOP coach, um, coaches, we are living proof um, that recovery is real, um, it works, and that with the right choices and work, it can happen for those still suffering. I think it's important for um, the patients or the clients to, um, to see that and to know that. Um, by incorporating um, our recovery experiences into supporting, empowering, educating, and guiding patients, um, we can sometimes help, and most of the times, a lot of the times, help where doctors, nurses, social workers, and other professionals may not be able to help. Um, we can get in. Um, the role of the peer support worker or close-op worker um, in this manner, I feel cannot be underestimated nor minimized as to the powerful effect um, it can have on changing the lives of those affected by mental illness issues and drug addiction um, and how it could make their lives better. Um, one of the key benefits um, for me, um, for the patient, is the greater perceived empathy and respect that um, peers are seen, seen to have on the individuals they, individuals they support. Also, peer support workers um, have benefits for themselves, for ourselves as well. Um, and it was mentioned earlier um, in the presentation, like um, increasing levels of self-esteem, confidence, and positive feelings that um, we are doing something good for a change. <laughs> um, which can decrease um, chances of relapse for us. Um, the services provided by peer support workers um, or OSOP coaches can, and most of the time, open the door to be a rapport, um, mutual trust, empowerment, and link, which can lead to linkages to treatment and other resources. Um, just as other professionals should not minimize the importance of our roles, neither, I feel, neither um, should we min minimize other professionals' roles. Um, I know I have to stay cognizant of the fact that my role is not that of a therapist. Um, I don't have 
that license or doctor or a nurse and so forth. Um, however, setting those kind of boundaries with the patients um, can lead to helping the patients set boundaries for themselves and explaining why we're setting those boundaries. Um, the role of OSOP worker, um, peer support specialist um, have been rewarding in my own personal life and recovery because I am constantly reminded of gratitude and that I just can't talk, I just can't just talk the talk. I must continue to walk the walk and stay vigilant in my own recovery. Um, so that's it for me. Thank you again for the opportunity and for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kareen, for sharing. Um, William, are you able to hear us? Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kareen, and everybody that went before me. And I want to say good afternoon to all the participants. Um, my name is William Ellis, and I'm an OSOP peer recovery coach here at Howard University and the, at the hospital. And being a peer is important to my 22 years of recovery as well. And, um, and this... Um, Basically, it's because there's nothing more essential in recovery than one peer helping another. I also have a background in addiction counseling and co-occurring disorders. And uh, with that, you know, I noticed that each peer's experience is unique but useful. My personal experience has been gratifying and purposeful. As a post coach, working here at Howard University Hospital, I've been able to intervene with such patients upon arrival to the ED. This is a vital time for the patient. And the reason it's a vital time is because the patient is at a fork in the road right now. And at that moment, the patient is trying, you're sitting there with the patient, and what you want to do when they're in that fork of that road, the first few things I want to do is gain trust from that patient and the confidence that um, I can help them. And through shared trust in, this, in my own shared, shared trust and experience, you know, that can happen. Uh, the initial goal is to get the patient to open up, and in turn, that enables the five stages of recovery. And I'll talk more about the five stages of recovery later. Uh, at this point in time, I have a caseload of 12 clients that I assist with overcoming their barriers to long-term recovery by utilizing resources and integrating services in the District of Columbia and all the while keeping addiction recovery as the number one priority in encouraging a recovery support plan. Being an OSOP, recovery, OSOP coach here at Howard has been very um, educational and unique because of working, the working relationship with the doctors, nurses, techs, social workers, and all the other hospital staff. The OSOP has been fully embraced here at Howard University Hospital. It has been supported and is utilized fully. And the role of the PRC is non-clinical and is secondary to the doctors and nurses' role. The, doc the doctors and nurses understand their jobs become more easier when they use the PRCs to address the patient's whole wellness, and the peers usually have a deeper understanding of the challenges of recovery from SUDS and it can gain personal trust from the patient. It also has helped trapped a lot of Patient. We help a lot of patients become sober and drug free, family oriented, community active, employed, self reliant, responsible, dependent on individuals or their community, thus reducing the number of opiate overdoses um, here in the District of Columbia. So, the five stages of changes which I would go over is pre contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. And most of the time, they, they had the um, first stage was a pre contemplation. But time to time, we get some who is actually in action. So the um, peer needs to be ready to go, suit up, show up, and get into action. Um, there's a lot more involved, but I think that was explained earlier through um, the, the others. But uh, it's, been ver it's been very good here. And um, the biggest challenge lately has been the virtual learning for the virtual um, 
not learning, but virtual um, um, in, encounters because of the um, lack of the technology with the patients and, and some of them who do go on to become clients. But um, for the most part, um, it hasn't been as challenging as I thought it was, would be because um, a lot of them do like the calls. They love to be checked in on. And um, that could have something to do with a little accountability, but we'll see. <laughs> But for right now, everything's going great. We have a good relationship in Howard. And um, I mean, the doctors and nurses, everybody uses us. Well, I mean, we know our roles. And um, it's been very good to see this in the action. And um, that's about it with me. Back to you. Thank you, William. Thank you, William. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, so this first one, I think I'd like to hear from both Shay and Raphael to speak kind of from the supervisor side, and then also from the peers to talk about their experience. So maybe start with the peers. Karina and William, what is something that your supervisor or um, providers in the ED have done that has really helped support your work? I, I can go. Um... Well, they actually come get us. The doctors will come and say, hey, I got someone I need you to see. They, they come from all areas of the hospital. They come from down in, in the sick crew in the OR. They come from upstairs and um, where they have been admitted. They come from straight from the emergency nurses station. The doctors will come to us and, or call us and tell us to come see certain patients. And um, they value our, um, our outlook on things. Yeah, so having a good relationship with them, definitely. Um, yes. Yeah. What about you, Kareen? Is there anything specific? Um, the only thing I can think of is that uh, my supervisor believed me when I, <laughs> when I make <laughs> some suggestions. That's, that's a big deal, um, you know, because um, unfortunately, there are um, those who do minimize peer support specialist roles um, because they have the license or they have the medical degree. Um, and I've been in that unfortunate position. Um, so it's a big deal to me when you believe I know what I'm talking about because I've been there. Um, and so um, I've gotten that support from my supervisor. Great to hear. Um, Shay or Raphael, do you want to speak to things that you've done as supervisors um, that you've noticed specifically, you know, works really well to support the peers in their work? Well, I think the point that Kareem made and William, I think, or Kareem maybe have said this about belief or taking what your peer says seriously, I think is uh, one, it builds trust and um, it makes, there's buy-in. And what in the program is better. I mean, point blank, when they, when the peers are engaged in the program, and there's no one who's going to be more passionate about the work than peers. Peers are the most passionate people about the work because they've been there. They have so much empathy for people. And so, you know, trying to really um, integrate their thoughts into the development of the program is going to make a huge difference in their in the amount that they engage and um, that that has been really good I also have found that um, recently I started implementing like one-on-one -on -one supervision every two weeks where it's like dedicated time um, and the peers have actually really liked that and I've been a little bit surprised but they really appreciate that time that's set apart. I mean, they know they can call me at any time, but I think they, they appreciate that like set apart time that I have with them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just always focusing on treating them as dignified people and putting your stigma to the side. I think we all have different like levels of prejudice or um, whatever. And I think, you know, working through that yourself and then making sure that you make people feel just like you would want any of your clients to feel. Make, make sure that your, your peers feel like, digni like they have dignity with you. So that's a big thing. Yeah, I would, I would add a couple of things came to mind. Um, definitely the one-to-one -one supervision. I know for me, I have a pretty large team, but I do one-on-one -on -one supervision 
every other week. And then also I, I set aside staff hours, hours every week that folks can access, right? Because oftentimes um, I have found that it alleviates a lot of stress and pressure when my staff have access and they know that they can talk to me about a particular issue or, you know, maybe they're working on a project and they're having a little self-doubt or just really, you know, needing to resolve an, a pro, uh, an issue that they're encountering that has made the world of a difference, having that guidance in that direction. The other thing that comes to mind, and it may seem very simple, but, um, and I'm going to talk in negatives, I know we're supposed to be positive, but don't hold individuals lived experience against them yes mm -hmm. right and so lived experience brings people to the table we know the intrinsic value of someone understanding right in any other field we would it's it's the same thing right oh you were in marketing and you have been a marketing director forever can you please support me and mentor me this is no different and so when um different challenges are in countered I am with Shay check those biases at the right check you and, and, and you know that's that is the work of the supervisor that and oftentimes the burden is put on peers but that's the burden of the supervisor right is to check your biases to say hey you know what this person has lived experience what is my mental model right we go into that kind of language what's my mental model around substances um right? Is it what I see, right? Um, your mental model, if you've got a family member, I know for me, like it's in my family, so I treat everyone like family, right? And so with very genuine, very, and I'm not saying that that's everybody's case and that you're not, I will just say I've seen it over and over again, that lived experience brings someone to the table and peers are celebrated for their effectiveness in finding clients, effectiveness in making sure that they are a part of treatment but then when a peer says hey i need a break i'm feeling like i just need a mental health day then it's an issue right and so um i was questioning in that particular area the other thing is specifically helping peers just like you would anyone else helping them to identify their strengths and their areas of improvement too often I have seen peers, the areas that they need to improve in being used mm -hmm. against them, right? And let's be real, like that is a universal, that's universal strengths and weaknesses, areas of improvement, like that's universal. But somehow when we move to peers providing a service, it be becomes magnified and it becomes like a performance issue as opposed to a knowledge issue. Right, as opposed to, hey, I need some support in how to engage this particular client. And if there is not an atmosphere with all of the things that we've discussed, like supervision, if there's not that particular atmosphere, I'm telling you, peers are placed in a position where they feel like their backs are against the wall, right? And so it creates an environment that is not conducive to getting the bottom line or, you know, we're administrators, the bottom line in our outcomes. So. Uh, I, um, I appreciate what uh, you just said, Raphael. You know what I try to do? A lot of things I try to do as a peer myself is make my supervisor job a little easier. You know, sometimes, like I say, suit up and show up. I bring my recovery right here at work. That means all the, the talk about responsibility, dependability, reliability, all this stuff that I'm that I'm that I have to project off, I have to bring, I've used it myself. So I had to actually exercise my own continual recovery because it's teaching me those values. And it makes the job a lot easier. It makes the supervisor, you know, has something they can have faith in and stuff like that. So I bring it to work and I talk with with my co with my um the other peers we talk about stuff like that, you know, because um what happens is for me as a peer, when I first see that that um, patient in the hospital, this might be the first face that patient might ever see and what recovery looks like. So I had to bring it. And a lot of times when I'm doing that, I also got to bring it all around the hospital because the hospital got, got people in it that's already toxic. And so I got to be bringing that all the way around it 
And even though the biases are there, after, after time, I change that perception by the way I present myself, my demeanor and my attitude changes. Does stuff come my way? Yes. But I have tools of recovery to use. And that's what we, that's what, that's where the game wins at for, for me here. And I pass right on to my, my coworkers and we keep on grinding at it. Because the most important thing is that person came in, came in that door through that emergency room. That's the most important person. Certainly. Um, I think we have time for two quick questions here. Um, one question for William and Kareen is, what are the typical age, range, age ranges of the patients that you see? Great question, because I know it's going to be different. Here at Howard Hospital, it's between 40 and 65. Okay. And what about you, Kareen, at GW? Um, yeah, in, in terms of the, the overdose um, patients, um, it's, it's about the same age range. Oh, okay. Yeah. We get, a, the younger patients are more uh, K2, marijuana, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's about the same. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. And then the last one here says, can the peers elaborate a little more, not only on the OSOP function, but the interventions of the SBIRT and MAT peers? Yes, I can. Uh, well, the, the intervention, which is called the SBIRT, is also called, what we do is the SBIRT system. It's a short, brief um, intervention, referral to treatment. And a lot of the OSOP people are involved in that too. And that consists of um, an introduction of self, you know, uh, to the patient. It also involves a little bit of motivational interviewing. It also involves um, a lot of um, um, understanding that a lot of, there's a lot of understanding in there because sometimes on the intervention, there's more to the overdose than just the overdose. Because when the person usually come in, if they overdosed in the middle of the sidewalk, they fell on their face. So now you're talking about waiting for, get, get, you know, waiting for them to get CAT scans and, you know, getting abrasions. So you have to wait for that and do maybe a part two intervention. But uh, with that in the referral, um, we have all the tools we need. We have all the resources we need. You know, um, we have plenty of resources. DBH has um, guided us through a lot of stuff. And, all the treatment centers are kind of aware of the peers here. So it's been, it's been very good on that process because that process helped the OSOP coach. Um, it really helps us on because usually when we know where they're going, what, what they're, um, it's all client or patient centered. So wherever the patient wants is where we're going, the direction we're going, because we're meeting where they're at. But at the, at the, um, at the end of it, I catch them. And I work with them in the community, and I try to help them get sustain some long term recovery, and uh, come get back into the community, become active again, become productive members of society. So that's the goal: is the is the long term recovery. But we all work together with the expert team and the OSOP. It's all one team; it's nothing separate, because sometimes they go out and not work with them, and then they end up back in, and they're getting another expert. And we try and see, you know, what's better for now. They want inpatient to the outpatient. You know, we work all together. Um, so uh, for me, so I've implemented the expert, um, and it really shows the the patient the risk involved in what they're using, um, the risk um, on the body and the mind. Um, there's different, um, we have different um, pages of risk um, for alcohol, uh, what the alcohol is doing to the body, um, um, how it's affecting the liver, um, how it's affecting um, the balancing, um, and cocaine and crack. So it's really um, 
I don't want to say risk management, but it shows the, the patients all the risk involved in using what they're using on the body um, and the mind. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, but to whomever asked that question, I would like to um, remind you there's a session tomorrow at one o'clock um, that will feature um, a host of different people from MedStar Washington Hospital Center, and one of them will be um, one of their expert coaches. Um, so if you're interested in hearing more about that, you can jump on that session tomorrow. Um, I want to say thank you so much to the four of you for this presentation. Mm -hmm. So helpful to hear um, all of your perspectives on this. I know we have a lot of folks on the line um, that have peer programs, that want peer programs, um, that are just curious about integrating peers into their organizations in general. So this is incredibly helpful. Um, so thank you very much to all of you for joining us this afternoon.